Uh, we've been talking about, uh, on, the, on the weeks that I've been teaching, on gifts. Gifts. And uh, not only gifts, but, but the, this whole subject that I wanted to, uh, to come up with, so people understand, is the importance of who we are, what we do, and, uh, and how, how we do it, and everything that's in between. So when we talk about uh, the gifts Uh, We talked about the five gifts that Jesus Christ gave to the church, those five gifts. And uh, because in our in our vision about who we are in Christ, how to live a life of the spirit and how you can reach your destiny. And so it's not just about who you are in Christ, how to live a life of the spirit and just whatever comes, whatever comes. It's how you can fulfill what God's put in your heart. And that's what the house of God will do to prepare. And uh, we had a long several weeks off on in the month of June because of, you know, a lot of activities and we didn't have some of our uh, young people coming up and being ready to preach, but it's about preparing people to walk in the gifts. So uh, tonight we're going to continue to talk about the gifts that the father gave. Jesus Christ gave five gifts to the church, five gifts. And I'm going to go back over some of those five gifts to the church. If you look at it in the Greek, it's the Doma gifts, and that's what separates it apart. The Father gave seven gifts, according to the book of Romans chapter 12. Those seven gifts are also referred to as grace gifts to some people or motivational gifts. So the five gifts of the Spirit, the Doma gifts, are gifts that we look at that are set aside for people, what we know and call into the uh, full time or the five fold ministry, and so uh, I don't want to just look at it as a five fold ministry. We talked a lot about that, but it's uh, this this doma gift. I, I just want to read to you because I don't think I've even read this before. Uh, the doma gift. The doma gifts are actually people within the body of Christ that are specially set apart to be the gift in the body of Christ in the aspects of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So that means that they're not the only ones that can preach the gospel. They're not the only ones that can teach the gospel. It's just that those are the ones that have been pulled out or what some people call twice called. You're called out of darkness and into light. You're born again. You're called out of darkness and into light. And then once you're in the body of Christ, you become faithful. God had his plan already in your life. You're called out of the flock and you're set apart in one of these fivefold gifts, or the Greek word called the doma gifts, and you're set apart to either be a pulpit person or something like that. And this is this is this comes with special anointings, uh, giftings that you have, and uh, that's what makes you who you are. Now, on the seven gifts of the Father, they're motivational gifts. These are gifts that I say. That helps you uh, in a way because uh, it's just, these are gifts that are just hardwired in you. That's the only way I know how to say it. These are things that are just hardwired in you. So you cannot operate in the five gifts, the Doma gifts of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. You cannot operate in that no matter how much you try unless you are set apart into that gift. Are you with me? But anyone, anyone and everyone in the body of Christ has access to the seven that we call motivational gifts or the seven gifts of the Father. Anyone in the body of Christ has access to these gifts. Now, you may have multiple, even those who are called in the Doma gifts or the five gifts of Jesus Christ, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Anyone in those set apart set aside, called out gifts, still has access to these motivational gifts. There's motivational gifts that motivate me. Giving is one of them. It's part of, I'm hardwired that way. You don't have to motivate me to give. I'm already motivated to give. Nobody has to talk me into give. I'm motivated. Do you get that? Nobody has to. It's just the way you, just the way people are wired. People are wired to hospitality. You don't have to motivate them to be hospitable. They are motivated that way. People are motivated in certain things. So that's why when you talked about these seven gifts and we break them down, 
There was one thing talked about prophecy. Well, we know that there was the prophet in the Doma gifts, and uh, some people try to make that the same thing. Or the nine gifts of the Spirit, where he talks about the three, you know, the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, the three that say something, the three that do something, three that reveal something, and they try to make it one. But these have three different functions because they're given by three different sides, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, even though one God. But they're given in that fashion. So we've been talking about uh, other gifts. And so tonight I'm going to share with you about the teacher. So go with me to the book of Romans chapter 12. Yeah. The book of Romans chapter 12. Just trying to get us caught up since it's been a while. Romans chapter 12. Verse 4, for as we have many members in the body, but all the members do not have the same function. Aren't you glad that everybody's not the same? That we're not a cookie cutter people? Come on, could you imagine everybody being like me? It'd be the most boring world to live in. Or like you, come on. Aren't you glad we're different one with another? Come on. No matter how much I enjoy chocolate ice cream, I wouldn't want everything to taste like chocolate ice cream. Come on. As much as I enjoy certain things, I wouldn't want that every day of my life. I would like, how many likes variety? Come on, variety. Just straight vanilla doesn't get me too excited. Unless you add some chocolate, some strawberry, and some pineapple, and a cherry on top, and you call it banana split. Now we're doing something. But just straight vanilla doesn't get me excited. I don't think we just need to be a straight vanilla church. And I'm not talking about color. <laughs> Dear God, we could use some color. But I'm not talking about a straight vanilla church. I'm talking about it's good that we have variety. Come on. I like stuff that's got some spice to it. Do we got any people like spice to it? Ron Witt, when he was here, he brought me a a quart bag full of cayenne peppers. I sat at dinner that night and took four of them. Just, just, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, enjoyed every bit of it. I like spice, but I don't want cayenne with my ice cream. Come on. So we like variety, but when variety is mixed the right way, it turns out beautiful. Come on. It turns out, and that's the way the body of Christ is. We're many members, but yet we're still one, one body. We don't all have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. That's all we have to understand. We're still, you know, if we get a revelation of this, it stops the striping. The enemy knows that I can destroy any life, any marriage, any church if I can recruit enough strifers. Let me say that again. The devil knows if I can recruit enough strifers I can stop any family, any church. Come on. I can stop anyone's progress if I get enough strifers, people strifing, people backbiting. Because that's it's deadly. Come on. Offense is deadly. Don't take the bait. You'll get caught in the trap. And once you're in it, he doesn't like to let you out. The enemy will do everything he can to keep you into the realm of offense. Stay out of it at all cost. You remind yourself every day, I refuse to live offended. I refuse to live offended. I refuse to take the bait. I refuse to live under that pressure. I refuse to live in strife. I'm not a strifer. I'm a man that walks with God or I'm a woman that walks with God. I'm here to bring life and encouragement to one another. Even though we're one body, we're many members, but we cannot fight against the body. The reason why some people die of certain diseases is because the body begins to fight against the body. And you cannot live that way. And if it happens that way medically, it has the same way spiritually. Come on. 
We have to bring life to different parts of the body. Encourage people. You know why some people always want to be in the pulpit? Because in one area, in their mind, they think there's no recognition. Nobody really knows how valuable I am if I just keep doing what I'm doing. So the enemy will get people in the trap thinking, well, you know, you ought to force your way out into the public more instead of just being who you are. Let me tell you, nobody has seen my liver. But without my liver, I don't function. Amen? Just because you're not seen doesn't mean you're not valued. Just because you're not visible doesn't mean that you're not valued. We see the parts out here. But this hand, I can lose both hands and still live. I can lose both hands and both legs and still live. If I lose my heart, if I lose my liver, if I lose certain internal parts that are vital organs, I can't live. And sometimes the most vital parts of the body of Christ are parts that are not seen, that you have to have the function. And most people get so caught up what they see and forget about what they don't see, and the enemy takes advantage of it, and then we start having turmoil. We've got to understand it's the parts that are not visible that makes us functional. You get that? So don't ever think you're not important. Don't ever think you're not important. Well, a man can live with only one kidney, but he functions better with two. A man can live with one lung, but he functions better with two. Come on. Yes, if you have to live with one lung, then you better believe God that you're going to be able to walk from here to the corner and still make it. But you're created to have two. Come on. We can survive without certain people. The enemy can influence people to leave parts of the body of Christ. We're not even going to talk about the local church here. The the enemy can influence people to leave parts of the body of Christ. We can can live, but we would function a whole lot better if they were part of us. And I say this by the Spirit of God. Some of you better get back in your function. So the enemy don't keep taking advantage of your weakness. You get back in your function, and then we won't take advantage of your weakness, okay? So it's part. It's very important that we understand that I exist for the purpose of serving God, and he placed me as a lively stone in his house. Not a dead stone, a lively stone. Come on. This is not just teaching. Now I'm under the unction now. We have to understand what this is all about, okay? So, uh... So these motivational gifts are given to all. Any of us can do it. So let's look at verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace, or that's where some people call them grace gifts, but I believe everything's of grace. Amen. We're saved by faith. We're, We're saved by grace through faith. So everything's of grace. So these gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. Let us use them. Now, when you're talking about the nine gifts of the Spirit, it's, you can't just use them. They operate as the Spirit wills. So you can't just prophesy uh, by the unction of God unless God moves on you with that unction. Come on. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, the, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, the discerning of spirits. Uh, you cannot do that. It's, these are by the Holy Spirit. They all function as he wills. But these hardwire gifts, you can function in them all the time. And if you learn how to use them, they bless you and people. But if you don't learn how to use them, they can no longer be a blessing to you or the people. Okay? If prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, we talked about that. Or ministry let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So these are these gifts that we are dealing with. So we dealt with prophecy. We've dealt with, with the ministry. Now we're going to deal with this teaching gift. This teaching gift is not. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're not dealing with the Doma gifts. That's done. You know, we call them the five gifts. Now, there is debates among theological scholars that there's only four of these gifts. 
because they say the apostle, prof, the apostle, comma, prophet, comma, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So some of them say pastor and teacher went together. So there's really four. But I'm just like the concept, the way it's done. In my interpretation, there's really five because I've been around some pastors that are very inspirational. They're just not very revelational when it comes to teaching the word of God. So every pastor ought to know how to teach, but that may not, that may not be their primary gift. Come on. I know some pastors, their primary gift is evangelistic. And uh, matter of fact, it can hinder them because they're trying to get their same congregation saved week after week. <laughs> that becomes like some of the third world countries that we're in. Uh, it's hard for people to pastor because they're always preaching of, you know, sermons to get people born again. It's already born again. And uh, so anyway, that's a whole other teaching. So, uh, so these gifts that we want to talk about is this teaching part here. And I want to lo- look at it. So uh, this is not the Ephesians 4.11 t- teacher where one teaches by the revelation of God. They see things by the spirit, by revelation in them. But this gift comes when you have a desire this is a whole motivational gift. You're hardwired this way. All you want to do is teach. Now, this is where we talked about before. Just because you're a school teacher, Sunday school teacher, doesn't mean that you are in the fivefold gift there. But this gift is, no matter what you do, give me a kid I want to teach him. Give me somebody I want to teach him. Give me someone I want to instruct him. You're just hardwired that way. You just want to teach. You want to educate. You want people to understand. You want people to, uh, to, to be... Uh, to uh, have knowledge of what's going on. These are the things that motivate you. These are the things that get you going. How can I teach this? I mean, it doesn't matter what happens. You cannot have a conversation and something comes up. You have to start teaching in the middle of it. You cannot talk about, you know, uh, you know that America went through a civil war. Uh, you have to wait and let everybody pause for 30 minutes until you give a little discourtation about the civil war. All right. So they're just things marked in us that are become part of that, that, that you can't help. Now, now anyone can, uh, you know, this is a, if we yield to it in the things of God, it could be beneficial in the things of God. But, you know, you, you have some people that were back in the day, used the word Sunday school, uh, I mean, they're just gifted at teaching Sunday school. But that doesn't mean they'd be a gifted person in the pulpit. It would be a different level of teaching. You understand? And uh, so that's what happens. Now, with, with understanding this, that, that we get to it, uh, this is one that we want to teach and we want to instruct. Now, this happens. It doesn't matter if it's in church, if it's in a work setting, a school setting, in your home, your children, your home. This is all about teaching. And uh, it's, you're, you're motivated. You're hardwired this way. Uh, and so this is where people get it. But there's some things in there that affects us. Now, we've talked about all of the positives comes with it. And each one of them, we'll, we've talked about some of the downfalls. But if the enemy can't, can't push you over in, you know, keep you out of something, he'll push you over in it. Now, just because people have certain gifts and they're motivated by it, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't fall into traps and in getting that done. You find somebody that is very gifted, very smart, very educational uh, in teaching. Uh, you'll you'll find there's, you'll find them at times if they don't keep a guard on it, they can get lifted up into pride. And the Bible talks about pride. The Bible says six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are abomination to him. And pride is mentioned twice inside of that. So if the enemy can get us into pride, then he'll take something that God hardwired us in and he'll use it for his benefit and will no longer be a blessing to you and no longer be a blessing to the people that you're going to instruct or teach. Does that make sense? And so uh, we have to understand that. So if you are one that's motivated by teaching, now, it's not just teaching. This, thing, this motivational gift can go deep. Uh, it goes into writing. Uh, you know, it goes into uh, sharing uh, information. Uh, 
And, uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I can see it, you know, even when I studied this out, uh, they are a visionary type person because, because they see beyond just that page that they're looking at. And so that's why it's hard for them to sometimes to stay out of this area where pride doesn't get it. And, uh, and also, you know, it's like I have preached from the pulpit and I've been to the back door and, uh, it's happened more than once. And I, I know dad and I've talked about it is, uh, you know, that, that was good. But, uh, have you seen this? And it's like, because you don't have time in 30 minutes to, to get it all out. Uh, sometimes people think that's all you know about it. But the truth is I, you just don't have time to exhaust a subject on Sunday morning. You know what I mean? You don't have time to exhaust a subject. So, so people that are hard, hard wired with teaching, it's almost like when we talked about people that has a prophetic or the prophecy part of it, that, that gift, just because they're aware of what's right and wrong, they'll start calling out what's wrong when at times they shouldn't call out what was, what was wrong because it wasn't the right place at the right time and they didn't have the jurisdiction to even do it. I gave the example then, I'll give it now. It's like some people want to rebuke someone where they don't have the jurisdictional power to do it. And all it does is create a rift between two people. You know, you go out of here to some of these covered bridges or some of these bridges, it tells you how much weight you can carry over that bridge. It has been proven when trucks have tried to carry more weight than what it costs for, it costs structural damage. And so the same thing happens when it comes to rebuke. If you carry 10, ton, 10 tons of rebuke over a five-ton bridge, you're going to cause structural damage, and you may not be able to fix it. Okay? So just because somebody's hardwired a certain way doesn't mean that now they have the right and the jurisdiction to just let that wire flow. you got to know how to stay in your lane. I've told staff for years, your rights in where their rights begin. That means your authority and what you do comes to this point, but then they pick up from this point to go on. And what happens is when you got people working together on jobs, schools, churches, these lines get blurry where people's jurisdictional lines are. And then people start getting ticked off and twisted and all kind of stuff that goes on. And what makes the kingdom of God function greatly is when we know where to stay in our own lane. And to make it right. Come on. Am I doing okay? All right. So, so this becomes, uh, it'd be easy for people of this caliber uh, to uh, criticize practical application because it's not deep enough for people. I, I tell people I have a challenge every Sunday morning. Uh, we have classes for all ages on Wednesday nights. And then we have, you know, nursery, preschool and then we have kids on the move on Sunday mornings. And, uh, and in the youth, you have 12-year-olds to high school. And you're saying that's a big gap. And they, they, you, need to, you need to talk to kids that are 10th, 11th, 12th grade, a little different than 6th, 7th, 8th grade. It's just different kids. You know? They go through different ch- challenges. But in the sanctuary, I have the same issue. I got people that are newly understanding God. They don't understand the deep things of God. And you got people who understand the deep things of God. They've walked in them for years. And if you're constantly feeding the deep people the deep things, the shallow people are, are uh, drowning in it because they don't get it and they're disconnected. And next thing you know, they don't feel like they're getting fed in it. So if you cater over to the shallow people, then uh, they're feeling like, man, I'm learning. But then all of a sudden, the deeper people think, pastor just don't know how to teach deep anymore. You know, he just, he's, all he does is teach shadow. And uh, so the, it's a challenge even in a sanctuary. It's a challenge everywhere you go. So you have to be able to know how to balance the board. And people have to understand in a congregational setting that there's times pastor's going to be shallow for those who are just learning, but yet he's going to know how to feed a little bit more to those who've been around. And it's something you have to, you have to f- follow. So there's times that I got to be very practical and there's times it can go very deep if you want to. 
Lois told me years ago, she said, one thing I like about your preaching, you know, and she said she read an article. She said, you know how to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Amen. And that what she said? Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, yeah, but I probably ate them more than I, before I got them on there. But anyway, but you know how to put them there for people to get. So that is something that you have to do. So, so, you know, because people are hardwired, it's hard for them to, to, uh, uh, disconnect from certain things, but you're hardwired to do it. So you might as well learn how to do it and do it with all your heart. Now you got some people that can teach. You need me to teach a class pastor. If you need me to do this, I'll do it. Even though it's not my deal, I'll do it. Uh, it seemed like the body of Christ went through a thing to where no one was led to do anything. Well, I'm just not led to do that. I'm not led. I'm not led. Right here, I, uh, I, 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 I did this. Uh, I pulled a bullet out of my pocket. How many members back when I did? I pulled a bullet out of my pocket. And I said, so many people here feel like you're not led. You've never felt led to do anything. After the service, come by, rub the top of this bullet. It's made out of lead. And you no longer can say, I don't, I've never felt lead. So, it was deep. It was a long time ago, but it was deep. But the point is, it was about feeling led to do that. I just don't feel led. You know, the Bible said he'll bless what he put your hand to. You don't have to. Even though I was called to do what I'm doing, even when I was serving here as an associate, I was still a deacon. Was a deacon your main call? No. But where, but, but where was there a need? I taught the class that Don teaches every week. Was that my deal? Is, was that the ultimate thing that God was, was, was calling me into? No. But it's what I put my hand to at the time. You see? And so that's what you got to do. So, so we have to, st- all of us has to sh- study to show ourselves approved unto God. We have to study to make sure that's right. And, uh, and so uh, in studying this, uh, even as last one that, uh, you know, we all have to no matter what, what you're doing. So we can't be critical because not everybody knows what you know. You can't be critical about that. I told someone the other day, I said, uh, there's things that God has showed me about spiritual laws that I, that, uh, I walk in, but I've never broke them down and taught from the pulpit. Never. There's things that I've learned by the Spirit of God I've never done series on. Just never done it. But another thing it says here, uh, being easily sidetracked by new things. You know, sometimes the more we get into something the more sidetracked we can get on some things. And, um, and so I was talking to someone today, and it was true. I said, I, I've got to get back into some things, man. I'm having so much fun doing this. I, got, I can't allow myself to get distracted. But the point is, there's so many things that we love to do naturally, and that's where it's at. So if you're hardwired to teach, teach. Keep your heart right with it, realizing that this is who you are, and you can do it. When you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night. You don't have to have a special anointing to do it. You don't have to feel a special goosebump to do it. You're hardwired to just teach. And no matter how often people try to keep you out of it or, or how difficult it may seem in the day, you have the ability to continue to do it because God graced you that way. And uh, thank God you're graced that way. Amen. How many teachers we have in the house? We have some over here, back there, back there, here, here. All right. You're graced that way. So what you do is, even though you're hardwired that way, don't do it without the anointing if you're in the house. If you're even doing it in a school, don't do it without the anointing. The anointing will take you places that you can't do on your own. And a lot of people that are probably gifted in it that didn't know what it is. No one ever taught them. They're gifted in it. They just don't know how to, uh, they just know how to draw on the anointing to get it done. So sure, you're going to see things other people don't see. Sure, you're going to have insight other people don't have. Sure, you're going to see into the weeds of it. 
that others don't see because that's who you are. That's, that's who you are. Not everybody is going to be like you. Not everybody's going to be like me. But all we've got to do is stay being like him. That's what the key is, all right? All right? So uh, there's, there's a whole lot more to say about that. But uh, if I take each one and take a week on each one of them, that's seven more weeks. And then another nine weeks or 12 weeks when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, you guys will be in survival mode by the time this is over. But anyway, let's look at the other one. With exhortation, exhort. Uh, exhorters. Someone said, well, I thought I was a teacher, but really I'm an exhorter. You may be graced with a couple of them. You're not, it's not a one and done thing. Aren't you glad you're not a one and done? You know, we talked about mm, the ministry administrating uh, leadership like that. I mean, there's a lot of people with special gifts. It's not because they're educated that way. They're just gifted that way. They're wired that way. And so this exhortation that we want to talk about here is, uh, you know, to, to exhort uh, in the King James or even the New King James. Uh, the word exhortation comes from a Greek word, uh, parakletus, meaning to, call, to be called to another side to aid. How many is motivated to run to the, someone else's aid? Someone else's aid. So we're talking recently to someone that uh, it's compassion in their heart. And, um, you know, uh, well, I'll just use uh, uh, Amber for a minute. You know, teacher. Hardwired that way. But yet would, move, would be moved to somebody else's aid, somebody else's need. So that's why it goes to show you, you're not just a one a one trick pony, so to speak. There are certain things that you do to make that happen. And uh, people are hardwired and they see that need and that's what happens. So, but to exhort, you know, we, we come from the word. There's another word that comes off that called paraclete, which, the, which means uh, called alongside to help. The Holy Spirit is our one who called alongside to help our helper, our paraclete. So he's called alongside to help us do what we do. Well, this exhortation is the same way. There's another word for exhortation, and that is encourager. I like this one. I love encouraging people. Now, well, you, sh well, you have rebuked me more than once. Well, you know, sometimes you just got to do because you're in a position to take care of things. But I've never rebuked anybody that I didn't make sure that I encouraged. I always make sure I encouraged them. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. I want people to be encouraged. I'm an encourager. You know, Barnabas was an encourager with Paul. And so I love this motivational gift. It doesn't matter how down someone else, they're trying to pick somebody else up. Hey, Don, how you doing, man? They're an encourager. Encourager. I'm telling you what, if there's a gift that people need to be released in, is this right here. A lot of people will take the chance to teach, prophesy, minister, administrate. But encouraging people becomes a big deal. How are you doing? I want to see people fulfill what God's called them to do so much. That motivates me. That does not take, take away from my apostolic pastoral gift. It motivates me for people to do what God called them to do. That's why I try to get people to stay connected. Don't let them pull you out. Don't get distracted with this. Do it. Do it. And so encouraging one another is good. When there's ushers up here, I do something. I want to say something to encourage them. I want to do something for people to know that they're important. And so I believe that this is a gift. It doesn't matter what happens. People, there's some people wired, they'll give the last, and it doesn't always mean it's connected to the giving gift. We're going to talk about giving. But they'll give money, they'll give their time, they'll give energy, they'll give, you know, day or night to encourage someone. Now there's pitfalls of that. There's pitfalls of that. 
is next thing you know, they're encouraging everybody else until they don't know how to encourage themselves in the Lord. And while they're building everybody else up, they are draining down. If you're going to be a true encourager, you're gifted that way. And maybe you say, I I just love encouraging people, but it's hard for me to stay up myself. That's because you spend a lot of time encouraging people. And you may not take the time you need to stay in the word of God to keep yourself built up. Because natural water balances itself. If you're full and the person's always empty, to get them half full, you're going to end up half full. Because balance, water will seek its own level. Joy will do the same thing. If you don't stay full on joy, you keep giving joy, you keep giving encouragement, you keep giving exhortation. Next thing you know, you're going to need encouraged. Then you start feeling sorry for yourself. I'm always encouraging everybody else and nobody's encouraging me. I don't know why people don't see what I really do in life. I'm just going to quit. I think I'll just stay home. No, you got to know how to keep yourself encouraged. So what if no one ever encouraged you? You know how to take the word of God and keep yourself encouraged? Remember, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. So so we must understand, uh, we can exhort now. Some people look at this word exhortation as in preaching. I brought this up. You may not remember how far back it it was. Or, you know, if you tied it together, I mentioned it. That you have some people that travel from church to church. We call them evangelists, but they're not really evangelists. They could be traveling teachers. They could be traveling musicians. And they share a little bit in between. There's people that have worship teams. They like to call. You know, not long ago I got a call that, you know, this is so-and-so. I'm an agent for this to this music team. And uh, we had a cancellation. We're going to be in Montgomery County. And we saw your church is not very far from there. And we just want to know if that date was available. We come in. And uh, so I, I get stuff like that. And so most likely... You have people coming in. You have the worship team here. Uh, You'll have a guest speaker. I don't know. I don't want to just name names, but you can have. You know where I'm getting at. But the leader of that, most likely, is not an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. They're a worship leader. In the five Doma gifts, it didn't say he gave some worship leaders. All right. But in that area of worship, which is important, what do they do in between some songs? Exhort. So there's an element of preaching that somebody may not be called an evangelist. They may not be a pastor or a teacher. They just know how to exhort people to just yield to God. Does that make sense? They just know how to exhort people to yield to God. And some people say they're... They're a good preacher. And actually, they're really not a preacher. They're just an exhorter. You give them an hour, and they'll fumble. You give them 15 minutes, and they'll exhort until you're ready to jump off the bridge into the arms of God. They just know how to exhort. And it's just a gift that people have in exhortation. The same problem is, because they have the gift to be called alongside to help somebody and exhort... Next thing you know, you got people saying, you know, you're a good preacher. You, you ought to be a pastor, not out here singing. <laughs> next thing you know, they go to a church and start pastoring. And next thing you know, they have collapsed and they're back with their bus again. Because they misinterpret their gift. Come on, they misinterpret the gift. So, I know people that some people think are very good evangelists. But when you look at the gift of evangelist, I don't really see it. But they are one dynamic exhorter. And in that exhorting, they can preach. But they preach from an exhorter's gifting. They're wired that way. 
Come on. And so, and you can't always divide that. You may not be, you may not be uh, keen enough to, to divide it because the only thing you know is that exhorting is moving my heart. So I would encourage all of you to encourage someone. Call someone and encourage them. Call someone to encourage them. And uh, uh, I believe that the Bible says that if you, if, you, if you want to be shown compassion, you show compassion. He'll have mercy on those who have mercy. And uh, let me tell you a spirit that the devil takes advantage of more than anything. Uh, this, I've already mentioned, this spirit of being critical of people and things, the enemy will hijack you on that. It totally hijack you. Uh, the truth is, when you're wired some way, it doesn't matter what, what it is. If it's preaching, if it's teaching, if it's singing, if it's exhorting. When you're wired that way, uh, you've got to stay out of that critical thinking that critical spirit thinking that you or anybody else could do it better because what happens is the enemy will begin to weaken you and even though you may be able to do it it will mess with your anointing and your gift to do it you've got to be able to know how to keep other people encouraged in this amen I, there's times I know for a fact, I know for a fact I've left this pulpit thinking I barely got on base. It was, a, it was barely a bunt. The pitcher probably made an error throwing the ball to first base. I got on base by an error probably. I felt that way more than once. But the people that said to me afterwards, that was good preaching, Pastor. I saw myself before the days out at least standing on second base. There's something about <laughs> there's something about knowing that you made first base, but you made it by somebody bobbling the ball. If not, you are out. But because people love you and they're encouragers, next thing you know, by Sunday night, they got you feeling like you're on second base. And the next thing you know, you're uh, on third base, but you didn't really hit a triple, and you know it. But you're on third. Come on. There's something about being together as one body that makes each one of us shine. Come on. You don't have to blow out somebody else's light for yours to shine brighter. Come on. I'm preaching real good now. I've done left the teaching anointing and went into the exhorting anointing. Come on. You don't have to, to do it. If somebody's never told you this, let me tell you again. It doesn't matter if you think your gift is important. I'll tell you right out from a pulpit of truth. I think it's important. And I need it. And God needs it. And the kingdom needs it. And I mean that with all of my heart. So quit being a pawn of the devil where he plays you and moves you where he wants you. And you jump back into the saddle of that gift and be a blessing to people. Come on, but keep your heart right, your heart humble, and let God be the one to exalt you and lift you up. Amen. All right. Well, that's about all I can do in one night. Huh? I made the third base. All right. I was going for the fences, but I made the third. Amen. Let's stand. Come on.